Um, I think we're live. <laughs> yeah, hey, we're everybody. Live. <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Jesse Runtime in here at Parity, and I'm here with the Frontier, uh, well, the Pure Stake team, and they're demoing Frontier for us today. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Alberto, who's going to introduce the team and get going with the presentation. Yeah, do you Thanks. want to mention parallel workshop tracks? Oh, yes. By the way, um, <laughs> there's four parallel workshop uh, tracks going on right now. So, yeah, currently this one's the Frontier one. All right, thanks, Jesse. So yeah, guys, uh, welcome. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alberto Vieira. I'm the Developer Re Relations Manager at PureState, and I'm joined by Joshi and Telmo. Uh, and together, we'll present you this workshop entitled "Using Frontier to Build an Ethereum-Compatible Substrate-Based Chain." So before we go into the presentation, we we thought it was nice to you know present uh, three of us. So. Like I mentioned, I'm Alberto. Uh, I'm the Developer Relations Manager. I joined PureStake early June. Uh, you have the info how you can contact me on the screen. I'm joined today by Joshi. He's a senior blockchain engineer at, at PureStake. He recently joined. You might have known him from the Substrate seminars if you've been into those. And also Telmo, uh, he's a senior software engineer uh, over a little bit over a year at PureStake. And he is a mastermind of, of the, our, our contribution into the Frontier project. So he's joining us to help us with the, you know, if there's any super technical question of, of Frontier, he's our guy to, to answer those. Um, all right, so before we head into the presentation, we also wanna work, uh, talk about the, the workshop structure. So uh, you know that we are building a, an Ethereum compatible parachain. And in order to do that, we use Substrate as well as the Frontier, right? But rather, rather than diving directly into this, you know, building frontier thing, we wanted to do a different approach and we decided to do an analogy with, with a car, right? The car being more or less frontier. So the first part of the talk is gonna be me telling you about this car. So I'm gonna do like a high level definitions about frontier, its components and everything. And, and after I do my bid, I'll take you for a test drive. So we're gonna, you know, test it around and, and we're gonna like get a hands on on how frontier feels uh, basically uh, on a substrate based chain, right? And then I'm gonna hand over the mic to Joshi, and he's yep. Yeah. So I'll after we go on the test drive with Alberto, then we're gonna sort of like pop up the hood on the car and take a look at the more detailed architecture, what parts come from Frontier, where they fit into the substrate node, and how they sort of interact with each other in sort of an architectural sort of way. And then once we've sort of got those fundamentals down about how the design's going to work, then we can actually get out our toolboxes and start hacking. And I'll teach you how to take a regular old Substrate node template and turn it into uh, an Ethereum compatible chain like Moonbeam using using Frontier. And uh, then I guess uh, we're we're hoping that we'll have some time at the end to just talk. I love that slide to talk about some of the challenges we faced. So in, in the workshop, we'll sort of present it as here's how you do it because we've done it in the past and it's, you know, hindsight is 2020, but it's uh, it was a little slower going the first time around. And also, you know, we're, we're not done. So there's still some design decisions to be made. So yeah, that's definitely. that's generally the the structure. So I'll, I'll let Alberto tell us about the car and give us a test drive. Yeah, sure, thanks. All right, so uh, I guess the first question we have to ask ourselves, it's what is Moonbeam? And uh, yeah, so basically Moonbeam is a smart contract parachain on Polkadot. So basically um, the idea, if you know the Polkadot architecture, you have the relay chain and they usually draw it in the middle, but the relay chain does not support smart contracts, right? And they let leave this implementation to the parachains. And that's what Moonbeam is. We, we aim to be a smart contract uh, platform uh, as a parachain on Polkadot, but we also aim to have full Ethereum compatibility. Um, I'm going to dive in, uh, dive in into this Ethereum compatibility bit in the next slide. Um, and we cannot, well, if we talk about Polkadot, we of course have to talk about the cross-chain integration because we want to be like the door uh, of, of Ethereum projects to the Polkadot ecosystem. So you have to mention the cross-chain integration as well. And we want to implement this as, as soon as the features like cross-chain communication and Spree become available. And just as a fun side note, the name Moonbeam comes from the Jazz standard Polkadots and Moonbeams. Uh, we get this question asked quite a lot, so I thought it was cool to include it on, on the slide. So um, yeah, of course, Moonbeam Ethereum's compatibility features also helps Polkadot, right? Because uh, we support Web3 and we have an EVM, so existing projects and, and developers can start working on, on Polkadot with minimal effort, right? And this is also related to the next point that we offer the choice of, of, of 
Ethereum develop, development tools, right? So developers can start building apps on Polkadot with the tools that they have used for multiple years, like two or three years, such as MetaMask, Truffle, Remix, and it's tools that they they feel comfortable with already, right? So, I mean, uh, we know that Substrate offers quite a, a wide range of tools, but they're quite new and people, you know, developers have to get used to these tools. But we also have, we already have devel uh, developers who have been working with these Ethereum tools for, you know, a couple of year years already. And we also want to have like the same feature set, but now for the Polkadot ecosystem. So it's not only smart contracts and tools, right? It's also the accounts format. We know that substrate-based chains are H256 and, uh, and uh, Ethereum is H160, uh, the signature support and subscription to events and a lot more features, okay? So I, uh, how do we bring Ethereum compatibility to a substrate-based chain? And basically this is the title of, of the presentation, so you already know the answer, right? And the answer to this is, is Frontier. Um, this is actually like my favorite definition of Frontier because I'm not like a super technical guy. Uh, those are my colleagues, you know, they're yeah, like more deep into Rust and everything. So from my point of view, I think this definition of Frontier is quite a, a good fit. And you have the, the GitHub repo here on the slide, right? So uh, th this black box definition basically says that if you're an Ethereum user or developer, Basically, and you're doing your, your stuff, you know, using your, your regular uh, MetaMask or Truffle, uh, you can see Frontier as a black box that is the middleware between your usage and, and the parachain, which in this case is Moonbeam, right? So basically, the, the end user, if you're using these Ethereum tools, doesn't really feel a difference. And, and you will actually notice this when we go into our, our test drive, okay? But I mean, this is a workshop and let's dive into a little bit more into detail. Uh, so basically here, this slide presents the high level components of Frontier, okay? So imagine we're an existing Ethereum D app uh, or a Truffle, and these two actually make calls, right? To the node or send transactions. And, and the first thing that, that, that from the node, you like grabs this calls is a Frontier RPC extension, which is basically a Web3 compatible API that maps all these stuff into substrate runtime calls. And then this works uh, with the Palette Ethereum as well. And the Palette Ethereum basically emulate blocks production from the Ethereum standpoint, because we have the substrate uh, blocks, but we, we also need the Ethereum blocks, right? Uh, then the Palette EVM, it's basically the access layer between the substrate based, based chain runtime and the EVM implementation in Rust, because we're using an EVM, but it's a Rust based EVM. And I, I guess with this very high level definition, we, we have enough knowledge to, to go into this test drive, right? And don't worry, because like I, we mentioned before, uh, Josh is going to go to the more technical side of, of things regarding Frontier. So for the demo and workshop, uh, we also shared a repo, a substrate uh, repository that we prepared where you, you find some like uh, the code because we we're going to use some big chunks of code and we, we prepared this so you can copy and paste. But basically, we're going to go through the regular Ethereum tools, right? So this is MetaMask, Remix, uh, the Web3 JavaScript library, uh, Truffle, and, and PopSub. And this later uh, PopSub feature, which is basically subscribed to, to events, it has become available on the latest release of Moonbase Alpha. And we have the release notes at the bottom part of the screen. So to do this, I'm going to click Escape. And I've prepared a browser here with some, some stuff, right? So. What I've done is that I pre-configured MetaMask uh, basically with two accounts. And we'll start saying that our MetaMask is connected to the main Ethereum network. Uh, so basically, you have to create a wallet and set up everything. I've created two accounts, Alice and Bob. And what I'm going to do now is show you how, can you how you can connect to, to the Moonbase Alpha, which is basically Moonbeam's testnet, right? And in order, in order to do so, if you head to our website, which is moonbeam.network, and you can click in our documentation website. We have basically prepared a very detailed documentation site where you can find all the help that you, you, you should need, right? So if we go to getting started and then uh, drive into the testnet uh, subsite, you will see that we have a few helpers here. And the one we're going to click is integrate MetaMask. And you will find uh, a step-by-step -step detail uh, of how to, you know, you can start with MetaMask, create a wallet, and then connecting to Moonbase Alpha, which is what we want, right? So the inform information that we need is down here. I mean, I already have this pre-configured as, as you noticed. So if I go back to MetaMask, I can go to the top right corner, click on settings, and then on networks. And then here you have all the pre-configured networks, 
but you can add, click the add network button and this will allow you to fill these fields here. And then basically you use the information from the website and then click save. Once you do that, I have mine already pre-filled as you can see, but once you do that and click save, basically uh, MetaMask connects automatically to Moonbase Alpha. In my case, because I had it already pre-added, I have to manually do so by clicking on the stop button and selecting Moonbase Alpha. All right, and then the next step is, I mean, uh, one thing I'm gonna pause here is that you can already see how, how cool this is, right? So we're using this Ethereum tool and, and we're, we're not even noticing that this is a substrate, substrate based uh, parachain, or in, in this case, uh, Moonbeam, right? This is substrate based, but we're using this uh, Ethereum tool without an issue. So the next step, are you gonna say something, Justin? Yeah, I just, well, I just wanted to ask you about that actually. So this is just like the regular old MetaMask that you pulled off of like, I don't know, the uh, web extension store, right? Like the, yeah, Fire, exactly. the Chrome so, store. Uh, yeah, the Chrome okay. store, and actually I installed it like 30 or 20 minutes before the, 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 the workshop. So, I mean, you can start with a fresh instance, not no like different version, old version, but compile it yourself. This is publicly available on the Chrome store. So it's yeah, no, nothing cool. weird, yeah. All right, so for the next step, um, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy Alice's address and the next step is to get some coins, right? Because we need, we need some coins to, to do things. Um, so we created a faucet that you can check in our website. You can set, check this button right here where it says faucet. And if you click on it, you will, you will see like the helpers to get you through this process, right? So basically what you need to do is go to Discord, which I have here and I already zoomed it in so you can actually see it. Uh, and then I'm gonna scroll down to the miscellaneous uh, bit and then click on Alphanet bot. And basically we see that Han uh, requested some tokens here. And what I'm gonna do is repeat that method, which is faucet, send, and then paste in my address. Um, this usually takes a while, right? Because the bot has to like send a transaction and then the, the, the network has to process it. But usually once this is uh, done, you will see this kind of message. And this is limited to uh, 10 dev tokens per hour per Discord user, okay? And we see now that the, the, the mission control sent us a message that this is confirmed. If I go back to MetaMask, I see that I have my 10 dev tokens. So that's pretty cool right there. I mean, it's a little bit tricky because here it's called dev, but then when we go to like activity, you will see it in ETH. I mean, this is the only bit that it's not <laughs> fully like uh, adapted, but I mean, it's the same functionality. So what I'm gonna do now, it's uh, from Alice, I'm gonna send five dev tokens to Bob. Just the, the normal demo that you usually do, right? From Alice to Bob. So I'm gonna send, send five dev tokens. Uh, we have the gas price set to zero. So in our test net, you can use a gas price of zero, okay? I mean, uh, this is gonna change in the future. But for now, we have left it to zero. So this is for an easy on-ramp of, of projects. So I'm gonna click confirm. And this will take a while as usually. Uh, our block time right now is at six seconds. So this takes a while to process. Um, one thing that uh, we can do while we wait for this transaction is that um, the next step of the workshop, we're gonna actually, no, we don't have any questions yet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like jump ahead to the next, oh, there we go. We, we got the transaction here. This is five dev tokens and we can see Bob, now it has five tokens. So yeah, great. Um, so now I'm gonna go to Remix, right? And I'm gonna open a new tab and tap Remix, ethereum.org. And basically, if you're not familiar with Remix, it's a really cool tool because it's, a, it's an integrated, well, yeah, it's an IDE. So it's an integrated uh, environment where you find uh, the Solidity compiler, you, have, uh, you can deploy contracts and interact with them. Um, it's, it's, it's a super cool uh, place to test things out. And what I've basically, if you're new to it, you have to, in this main screen, you have to click on this Solidity button, and this will install uh, the Solidity compiler tab and the deploy and runs transactions tab. And this will be used to basically compile and deploy contracts, right? If you're following this along in our repo, you, you will find these files that we'll use for today. So basically the, full, the first contract that I wanna show you is a simple storage. I'm not gonna go like through details of the contract, but we're storing a variable in here. And then in the constructor function, which is deployed once the contract is, is, is run, when the contract is deployed, we can set an initial value and the function is basically to change it. So if we go into the compiler tab, I usually have it in auto compile, but if not, you can just click here, compile. Oh, notice that we're using the, the latest uh, Solidity version. So this is pretty cool that you can use uh, whatever, you know, it's latest on Ethereum. 
Um, and once we compile it and we go into this deploy tab, you can see that we have our contract right here, right? So before we deploy it, we have to be careful and select here Injected Web3, because if not, basically we're using the JavaScript virtual machine. And so this is a local environment and not in Moonbase Alpha. Um, if you're doing this for the first time, you will see a, a MetaMask pop-up window at the saying that it's Remix is asking permission to access your wallet. But I, I've done this before, so that's why I don't get it. So you can see that I have my Alice account here with five ethers, and in this case it's dev. And then we can deploy this contract by typing whatever input. So I'm gonna put 15, because today is October 15th. And when I click deploy, you will see MetaMask popping up. It looks weird because I have it on super zoomed, but you can see that I have everything here and I can click confirm. And if I open MetaMask, you will see that it's, I mean, it's probably too small for you to see, but it's here is the transaction is pending, right? Um, once again, you can notice that I'm not doing anything strange, right? I'm using MetaMask as a Web3 provider and I'm pointing it into Remix, right? Once this is uh, basically deployed, the contract, it, it will appear down here. And you can see that I can use this, uh, this two methods. This one is to, to call for the value of the stored uh, number, and this is to change it, right? So I can click here, I have my value of 15, and if I put here 16, because it's tomorrow, I'll click here and then MetaMask will pop up saying that I have to sign this transaction. And uh, once again, when this is finished, I can just check the new value. Usually it takes a while, so there it is. So then I can just click on stored and we have 16. So yeah, I mean, uh, pretty cool, right? We have used already two uh, tools that are widely used on, on the Ethereum development side. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open my Visual Studio code and I prepared some like examples that we can run through. I think they, they look okay on your screen, hopefully. So the first one that I'm gonna show you is this transaction uh, uh, file. Basically, we're gonna use a Web3 library. So if you don't have it installed, you have to run npm install Web3, right? I have it already installed, but if you if you don't, please please do so. And once that you have the Web3 library, you have to import it as a Web3 constructor right here in Caps. And then we can create our, our Web3 instance uh, basically by passing in the, the provider uh, URL that we have right here. I have pre-configured this with my private key of this account. These are public, so please don't use them. Um, and basically what this file does is just, you know, using the Web3 library, it uses a sign transaction method. And this just signs a transaction saying the address from, address through, other address to, the value, and then we sign it with a private key, right? And notice that we're using a regular uh, Ethereum account and a regular Ethereum private key, right? And then I can use Node to basically deploy that script. I've added some console logs just to make it like look pretty. Uh, you see they here that we're making a transaction. This is Alice and this is Bob. And uh, basically it's gonna print out the transaction hash once this is done, as we can see right here. And of course we can pop back to MetaMask and confirm that this was done. It usually takes a while to refresh. Oh, there you go. So now Alice has four and Bob has six. So, I mean, cool. For the next bit, I'm gonna deploy a contract. Uh, in order to do so, I prepared a file that you can find on the repo as well. So this file has basically the bytecode and the ABI. This is a simple incrementer contract. It's an example that it's also in our, our website, our documentation website. So basically what we're doing here, once again, using the Web3 library, uh, we're gonna import this bytecode and ABI. And this is the same as before. Uh, the only difference is that we have to create a local instance of our contract, passing the ABI to this Web3 method. And then we're gonna use, once the local instance is, is, is already here, we can use the deploy method, passing in the bytecode and the arguments of our constructor function. So what we're doing here is saying that our initial stored value is gonna be five. And then we create our, our transaction object and sign it using the sign transaction method. And this is once again, just logging in. Uh, we, we have to use the same send sign transaction in order to, to, to send this to the blockchain. And this is just for, for console logging purposes, just to get the contract address. So I'm gonna run node, zero to deploy contract. And you see that we're attempting to deploy a contract from this account. 
and it usually takes a while, but we will get uh, the contract address. There we go. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to do something that you know it, you can do in Ethereum as well, which is uh, grab this contract, go back to Remix. This is a contract that is already deployed on, on Moonbase Alpha, right? So if I if I open the file so that uh, Remix has the, the ABI and the bytecode, I can actually go to, to this deploy and runs transaction tab and load that contract here when you see this, uh, this bit down here. And then when I click add address, basically Remix is gonna add that contract here as a deployed contract and we can interact with it. So we have this functions that are uh, programmed into the contract. I can check the number, which was five. I can reset it to zero and increment it. I'm not gonna do this because it's it, this, we don't need to do it. But anyways, just to show you how we're doing all these uh, things with Moonbase Alpha, right? Um, for the next bit, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna deploy an ERC20 token contract with Truffle. So this bit is not in the repo because you know there's a, a little bit more of, of like uh, uh, configuring stuff before we do it. So uh, if you can follow along, and I'll leave this example afterwards, the, the workshop on the repo if you want to if you want to do it. So basically, I created a Truffle folder, which we have my, my token contract. Uh, it's basically a simple ERC20 contract from Open Zeppelin. Uh, we're using the Open Zeppelin library here, so you have to npm install that. And basically, we have an initial supply, and we're going to name the token Subzero token, and the symbol is going to be Subzero, right? So um, you know that in Truffle, you have the deployment script, which is basically importing the, the Solidity contract here, and, and just deploy it using the, the we have to pass in the, the, the initial token supply, which in this case is 8 million with 18 zeros, because you have to remember that this is in way, right? And the other thing I wanted to show you is the Truffle config file. So basically here we're using, a, for now, a private provider that we programmed. Uh, I mean, we're, we expect that in the future you can use the HG wallet provider or any, any regular provider that is used normally in Truffle. But for now, uh, we, we recommend use this private provider that I'll, link, I'll leave a link on the repo, but you can find it in the moving repo as well. Uh, so for now, we, in the private provider, you pass in the private key and the URL of, of Moonbase Alpha, right? So with all this set, what I can do now is basically run, um, if you don't have Truffle globally installed, you'll have to go to node modules and then bin and then Truffle. Oops, Oops. it's not grabbing it. Anyways, I'll just, I'll have it, I have it uh, installed globally. So I'll use Truffle and then I'll go migrate and then that shacks network, Moonbase. And when you do this, uh, Truffle, Ooh, it's not, oh yeah, yeah, I know what happened. Sorry about that. So I have to go to the Truffle folder. So I can go to node modules and then bin and then Truffle. Yeah, this works. And then migrate dash apps network moonbase. Right, and then Truffle is gonna compile those contracts and then basically deploy them. Uh, you know that the, in the Truffle deployment schemes, you have the migrations contract, which is deployed first, which is what's going on right now. Hopefully you see it. Yeah, I think you see this, this text. And then once Truffle is deployed, then it will go and deploy the, the ERC20 token contract that, that we, we're, we're using. Um, and just a question, um, Alberto, yeah. while you're deploying this, um, does this specifically work with the tools you're showing us or is this pretty much almost any library and any tool um, available on Ethereum you can kind of just plug in and go with? Uh, what do you mean? Sorry, I did so not... like um, so like currently, you know, a lot of people like Web three, but um, you know, also Ethers is a very popular library. Um, would that kind of work out of the box? Just put in the proper provider. Um, oh, I mean, I have I have not tried that, but I can. Yeah, we can definitely try it. But I mean, basically, at the end, this is just like a Truffle. Just just like maps this stuff into regular, you know, Web three calls, right? But mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't tried that other library. I mean, we can probably we can, we can, it should probably definitely work, but. That's cool. Yeah, no, because yeah. just I know a lot of awesome tools around the space that <laughs> always people have their own lock-in uh, to what. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you see a lot of different stuff. Like usually, I I've seen people use Truffle, but then with TypeScript, right, to run the, their scripts. So I mean, uh, I uh, people do a lot of things, but definitely that's something that we can we can try to 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 try to you know test it out and if it if it works. Yeah, awesome. All right, so now we have the contract address, as you can see right here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to repeat the process that I did before. 
and I'm going to go to Remix and open up the token contract. And then I'm going to, uh, so it's loading up stuff from GitHub. And then I'm going to add it here, right? Uh, so you can see I have my token contract here and I can, you know, check the name, which is Sub-Zero token, the symbol and all of that. But what I'm going to do is actually going to go to MetaMask and here in this asset tab, you can actually add this token, right? So let's add this, uh, this uh, Sub-Zero token. So click on the custom token and paste in the address and you will see this, this two fields that will autofill with the information. And when I click next, you can see that I have uh, 8 million uh, Sub-Zero tokens. So Alice has... 8 million Sub-Zero tokens. And I, I can try to send these tokens to Bob, but I'm going to do something first with PopSub because actually we're going to do use this functionality to show you some features of PopSub, right? So I'm going to go now and go back to, to this. Let me clear my terminal just for explain purposes. I have to go back. And then the next file that we're going to use is the 03 file, which is basically a PopSub related thing, right? So what we're looking for here is to subscribe to Ethereum style events, right? So basically uh, I can show you actually, I have it here. This is a regular Web3 documentation online. And this is a method that we're gonna use, the Web3 ETH subscribe. And you have this, this different this different types of, of, of subscription events, right? So pending transactions, new block headers, syncing and logs. And today we're gonna to, we're gonna go through through this three, not not the syncing one, because this is a little bit harder to like set it up to so, so we can show you. But uh, so the first one we're gonna do is the pending transactions, right? So we're gonna basically once again use the Web3 library. We're gonna connect to it basically using the secure web socket and use the web3 subscribe methods passing in pending transactions. So now if I do node 03, you will see that this is a transaction ID. And if I'm lucky enough, someone will actually send a transaction right now and we'll see the trans transaction hash. I mean, I've tested multiple times and we, I'm usually lucky, but if not, I'll have to like go back and do a transaction. Come on, <laughs> this is so typical. All right, there we go, we're lucky. So, <laughs> so this is uh, the transaction hash of a pending transaction right now, okay? Oh, we see more, like that. it just asked for one and we got three, so. I'm gonna close this now, but I mean, just to show you the functionality is that now you can subscribe to like events. This is pretty cool. This is a feature that we've added this week. So it's, it's really exciting to see it. Um, the next uh, file that I'm gonna show you, it's um, the, we're gonna subscribe to the new block headers. So this is once again, the same as before, we're like we're using WebSocket. And the only thing that changes here is the, this this uh, type of subscription, right? And by the way, this is just like the, the callback function. This, this is nothing like weird. Um, so I'm gonna run node. Uh, with this 04 file. Once again, we have, I'm gonna stop it because then it's gonna get like full of information. Uh, but basically you can see here that we have this description ID and we get some information regarding the, 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 the block headers. You might notice that, you know, we have some missing info, right? Like the author or like what's the minor. And this, this type of thing is, it's an issue that we'll talk and later on in the presentation. But uh, to sum it up, it's basically, we, we tested all these features on a standalone version of, of, of Moonbase, right? And then when you move to a parachain, uh, relay chain configuration on, on Cumulus, this actually, a lot of, a lot of information is, is missing. So it's just like to give you, like to explain the reason why this, this information might be missing, right? Um, and the last thing I'm hey, gonna- I wanted yeah. to just interrupt real quick, Alberto, to point out like, yeah, since you're using all these Ethereum tools, what we're getting back here for like this block header is really an Ethereum formatted block header. This isn't like a substrate data structure. We're just querying a substrate node and it's smart enough, thanks to what Frontier gave us to actually like encode. Yeah, not all, as you mentioned, but like most and more all the time of, of the block information into this Ethereum format. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, this is a good point that here you can see uh, we use this gas. This is probably a simple, a simple transaction. Another, another, like it's it's a it's a not that important point, but the timestamp, for example, in substrate timestamp is milliseconds, and in an Ethereum node and an Ethereum block, it's actually on sec on seconds. Yeah, so that's uh, some some key differences there. But so yeah, um, and the last example I'm going to show you, I think it's the most interesting use case, which is basically you can subscribe to like logs that, or events that are emitted by a contract. Uh, so this script basically uses the same Web3 subscribe method. But then we put here logs and we have to pass in the contract address. 
This is the event signature that I'm going to go through how to get this in a bit. And then basically, this is a callback function, right? Um, so basically, what we're going to do is we're going to use that ERC20 token contract that we just uh, deployed. And we're going to put the address here. And we're going to subscribe to the event that it's made when a transfer is made, right? So let me go back to the browser and I'm going to show you two things. Okay. So if you go to this open sampling, uh, this is a repo and this is the ERC20 token contract. Basically, you see that an event uh, called transfer is emitted and it basically has three information, three pieces of information, right? So you have the address from, which is index, and this is important. You will know in a, in a bit why. So we have the address to, which is index as well, and we have the value that it's being transferred, okay? In order to get the signature of this event, basically what you have to do, I usually use this online tool. It's a keychack 256 uh, online hash function. And basically uh, put this, right? So this is the event name and the types that are passed in with nothing more, and you get this hash value. And this is actually what you have to include in this, in this topics. And I, I don't know if I explain why we do this, right? So the reason we do this is that what we're telling here this is to the subscri subscription is that we want to only get the, the, instead of all the events that are emitted by the contract, then that we get if we actually eliminate this topics uh, property. Basically, we, want, we only want to get the, the, the logs of the events emitted by this transfer event and nothing more, right? So what now what we have to do is copy the contract's address, which I have here in Remix. And I'll paste it in here. And uh, so I'm going to explain what I'm going to do, and then I'll do it because there are going to be like a couple steps that I, I'll, I'll do like in, in one, one go. Basically, I'm going to run this file. I'm going to get a subscription ID, and then I'll move to MetaMask, and I'm going to send tokens from Alice to Bob, right? And once I do that, I'll go back to, to Visual Studio to show you the, the event, the log that we got, right? So let's run this file. Uh, we get the subscription ID. So I'll head back to MetaMask. And we have Alice with it's like 8 million tokens. And she wants to share some with Bob. Let's put 100. I'm going to put the gas price to zero because I mentioned that we don't need to pay for a gas price right now. And I'm going to put it as a gas limit to 100,000 just because this will work. When I click next and confirm, you see the transaction here. I can, uh, yeah, I mean, this is sending the sub zero token. I can go back. To, to Visual Studio and you see the lock of the of the event, right? I mean, this is this is pretty cool because uh, PopStop is, is quite used by D apps, you know, to fetch all this type of information or it's also used as a cheap mean of storage as well. So uh, this is a functionality that, that it has been added to Frontier this week and we've implemented, actually not this week, but we've implemented it into Moonbase this, this week. So let's let's dig down a little bit into this, this, this uh, lock that we got. Basically, uh, you might ask, where's the information, right? So, oops, I got timed out of the connection. Um, basically, you can see as a first topic, we get the event signature. That's, so that's what we calculated before. And then because the from address and the to address are indexed, and they can actually be used as a, as a filter as well, and, I, and I'll explain this in a bit, they're actually included in the, as a return of topics. You can see right here that this is Alice's address, but we have to pad a, a bunch of zeros because um, Ethereum, I, I think it has 40 hex characters and Substrate has 64. So we have to have 24 zeros in order to fill in the, the array. And then this is Bob address right here. And the reason they're included in the topics is that we can actually filter by addresses. So let's say we only want to receive events that are emitted by the transfer event and logs that are emitted by the transfer event and, and, uh, and uh, are actually emitted by Alice only, right? So we can actually add her address here and we can filter it like that, right? Uh, we have a, a, a new article that came up this week regarding PopSub. There's some limitations with this, so I'm not gonna go through them, but you can visit the article, it's in our doc site. Uh, but anyways, this is, this is just to showcase a little bit about this functionality. Uh, regarding the value, because it's not indexed, it's actually returned in the data field. And it's, it's encoded, right? So if you want to get the, the, the actual value that was transferred, I usually use another online based tool, which is a Web3 type converter. And basically, you paste in here, uh, and this will convert from you know uh, bytes 32 hex into a stringer number. And basically, you can see that this is 100 with 18 zeros, which is you know the decimals being that this is in in way.
And yeah, I think that's that's it on my side, Joshi. So I'll close down my sharing. And thank you guys for listening. And I'll be on the chat and, and I'll, I'll pop back in, in a little bit. So oh, I don't know if uh, oh, you have any questions, Jesse. Yeah, quickly, um, some, uh, Scott uh, asked a question and he's asking, yeah. are there any blockchain explorers yet or plans on blockchain explorers for Moonbeam? Well, this is actually a cool question. I mean, we don't have like a native uh, blockchain explorer. Uh, you can use for the substrate uh, part of our chain, you can use the Polka.js app. So this is a regular uh, substrate based explorer. But I found this is pretty cool tool that it's, it's uh, basically it allows you to to let me let me pop it back to the screen. So this is like a, an open source project that that we found that actually is able to connect to to any Ethereum based chain, right? And you can see here that this is basically an, an Ethereum explorer, as you as you can see, and you can see the transaction counts. Of course, there is some limited amount of information, like the author of the blocks. We don't we don't see it here. And but basically, you you can see that we're using a third party block explorer uh, that it's, it's it's native for any Ethereum based chain. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, into Moon, we're connecting this into Moonbase, which I think it, it also showcase you know this this Ethereum compatibility features. Yeah, this is really cool, and I'm glad that question came up. I actually didn't know this explorer would work. So, and and let me just make sure I understood. This is the same story as you said with like MetaMask and everything. This is just some Ethereum block explorer you found, and it worked with Moonbeam without yeah, us having yeah. to. You yeah, can see cool. that. You, you can see that actually, if you're running a standalone node, you can basically see. I don't know. No, you probably don't see it. But let me let me put this into into here so you actually see it on the screen. So this is the URL of the explorer, and you can see that this is pointing to basically the, the URL of Moonbase Alpha. So you can put any URL there, either if it's a standalone node or whatever, and it, it'll work with that node, so yeah. Yeah, awesome. that's great. You should drop that in the troll box too. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, right. And another question coming in, um, just with the events, uh, one thing you can do on Ethereum, you can say, hey, go back 24 hours or go back this many blocks and um, tell me all the events that happened before then. Can you also do this, uh, do that? Um, with the current version that you're running? Th that's a really good question. I, I think Telmo has been working on this. So I don't know, Telmo, if you have any any comment on this? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Uh, funny, funny enough, I'm working right now on that. <laughs> now, you can get past events, but we are exploring right now the more efficient way of doing that because let's not forget that we are at the end emulating, right? And we, we need to leverage on substrate functionality to, to, to do that, right? So we are exploring different uh, possibilities. Uh, right now is, uh, so right now to, to be able to run the node and not don't crash it or don't uh, overflow the memory, basically it's limited, it's hard limited. But in order to get unlimited historical data, we are exploring um, the possibility of uh, uh, storing the Bloom filters in either the auxiliary storage or the header digests to quickly scan back historical data to retrieve the past events. So it's definitely possible and it's, it's happening right now. We are just figuring out the best way of, of doing it. The faster way. Amazing. Um, and I guess one last personal question for me: um, Is it just me, or is the event signature slightly longer than that in Ethereum? Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right, and that's something that we also notice, uh, and we're we're working with that as well. <laughs> okay, cool. But yeah, I, I guess in, in Ethereum you have a hex. Actually, it's a hex, and I think it's like forty characters long. Uh, so yeah, that's something that we'll we'll probably release in the next upgrade. But I mean, for now, you have the the, the logs functionality uh, to to play around with. <laughs> All right, that's uh, a sharp eye, Jesse. Good catch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think there is no any other questions. I think we answered them all. Yeah, I think so. All right, Joshi. Then I'll let me stop sharing. And there we go. Okay, yeah, sounds good. So maybe just before I uh, take the, the share and everything, I just wanted to sort of talk about my style. And so I do really good when people like interrupt with questions and stuff, and that's totally welcome. So at any point, feel free to like interrupt or, or derail or anything like that. Um, okay, so let me, let me share the, the slides. Uh, okay, um, are my slides showing? 
Yep, can see them. Okay. All right, cool. Let me get back to. Uh, oh yeah, okay, cool. So uh, this is where I'm going to start. Um, you know, basically, Alberto just took us on an awesome test drive of this node that, for almost every practical purpose, worked like an Ethereum node, but it's actually built on Substrate. And so now that we have a sense of exactly what we're trying to do and just how compatible we're trying to be, not just like simulating an EVM, but actually like answering Ethereum style queries and accepting Ethereum style transactions. In the second part, what I wanna do is actually show you how you can start with a vanilla substrate node, like the node template and build up something that's a lot like Moonbeam, something like what Alberta just showed us. And the answer to that is obviously with the, the Frontier project. And so we'll, I guess um, this is the looking under the hood part. I'm going to show you some sort of architectural diagrams and then we'll jump into the editor and get started. Um, so hopefully everybody saw Dan's talk about the architecture of a substrate node this morning. If you didn't, I'll just do a quick recap, but that's pretty much where we're going to be starting. And um, this is this is the diagram that he showed essentially. This, it's sort of in the moonbeam colors and like slightly modified to emphasize different things, but this is the structure of a regular substrate node like the, the node template. So we've, you know, we've got our runtime there. It has some pallets. We could add more if we want. We have this storage database that stores all the, the state of the runtime. And a lot of talks earlier in the day talked a lot about how the WASM runtime is stored in there. And then we have this, uh, you know, block database. And so if we think of this as just like the most generic substrate node, what I want to do now is show you how different pieces get added in to, to build something with Frontier. So the first thing we're going to need is an actual EVM. If we want to execute, uh, you know, the code that targets Ethereum, we need its virtual machine. And luckily one already exists and it was written by Wei Tang, a parody employee and a just general rust badass. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and, and take his. So it's published on crates.io and it's ready, you know, for anyone to use. But the question remains, like, how or where do we connect this thing into the substrate node? Maybe we can just glue it onto the side. Well, it turns out the natural place to put the EVM is inside of the runtime. After all, the EVM sort of is the runtime logic for the Ethereum chain. And so that's where we'll put it in our chain as well. And the way that we'll do that, since we're using frame, is we'll just go ahead and include the EVM inside this palette. Um, and so this is a big step, right? We, we have this already working EVM. It's now included in our runtime. And it really can do stuff like execute Ethereum bytecode and transfer um, you know, an inbuilt token that acts a lot like ETH. But we're really, really far from done. We don't have really any kind of compatibility. We can't accept Ethereum style transactions. We can't answer Ethereum formatted queries. We don't even have Ethereum formatted data to, data to answer those queries with if we could understand them. So we've sort of done like the, the base level now. We've installed this EVM in our runtime. Um, so the next step is this Ethereum palette. Frontier project contains a palette called Ethereum and it adds an unsigned extrinsic where users can submit raw unmodified Ethereum transactions. So if you aren't familiar with unsigned extrinsics, they are just like regular transactions, except that they aren't signed by any substrate account. And since they don't need to be signed by a substrate account, that means we can just accept the raw bytes of an Ethereum transaction and extract the sender, signature, gas price, and you know whatever else we need. And then once we have that, then we can pass all that information into the underlying pallet EVM that we installed previously. So deploying contracts and submitting transactions is only, only half the story. Uh, we also care about reading this Ethereum formatted data out of the blockchain, just like I was pointing out in Alberto's demo when he got back like Ethereum formatted block headers. And that's important because dApps that are already written targeting Ethereum, we want them to run on Moonbeam and those are the kinds of queries that they're gonna make. Ethereum formatted queries in, Ethereum formatted data out. So Palette Ethereum, in, in addition to providing that unsigned extrinsic that allows us to call or to like execute Ethereum formatted transactions, it also calculates a bunch of Ethereum formatted data and stores that data in the runtime. So specifically like transaction logs, transaction receipts, and really even the entire Ethereum formatted block are all calculated by this palette and included in its runtime storage. Um, so this idea of storing entire Ethereum style blocks inside the runtime is known as wrapper blocks. And it's the brainchild of Wei Tang, the same guy I mentioned who wrote the, uh, the Rust EVM. 
Uh, and it's called wrapper blocks because each substrate block has in its storage an entire Ethereum block. So the substrate sort block sort of like wraps the Ethereum block. And it's worth noting that while we're doing this technique for Ethereum, the wrapped block technique really can be used a lot more generally. Like, for example, you could make a Bitcoin compatible parachain using this exact same technique. So let's just take like a quick look into some, some of the code I mentioned here. So this is code that comes from the pallet Ethereum and it's inside of the Deco module part of our runtime. And so what that means is that we're providing like some kind of extrinsic that a user can submit. And you can see it says ensure none. And what that does is basically means that this is an unsigned extrinsic. And um, yeah, so this is this is the entry point. This is where we take in the, the transaction and then we pass it along. You can see we pass it along into this like helper function called execute. That does all of the actual interesting stuff like figuring out, okay, who let's decode this thing, who signed it. Or actually you can see we get the signer right, right up at the beginning, let source equal. Um, and then finally, we just deposit a regular old substrate event that goes back into the like normal substrate part of the block. And then the other part I wanted to show you, this is also from Pallet Ethereum, and this is the Deco storage block. And you can see we've declared like four storage items there. And uh, the first one I'll only mention briefly, I kind of want to treat that as an implementation detail. It's basically where Ethereum tra transactions get queued up, and then at the end of the block, they, they all get executed. But the other three are ones that I want to focus on a little bit more. And you can see they're called current block, current receipts, and current transaction statuses. And what they do is they contain and store the Ethereum style and Ethereum encoded, well, block, transaction receipts, and statuses. And what happens is in on finalize, we calculate all those things and then we put them into storage. And so they're in the state of the blockchain at this block forever. And then at the beginning of the next block, we kill those storage items, erasing the old you know, block and receipts and everything so that they'll be replaced at the end of the current block. And so we do that every single block. We queue up some Ethereum style transactions. We execute them. We calculate all this Ethereum style data and we write it to storage. And then at the next block, we clear all that out and do it again. And so we're executing those transactions in the pallet EVM, just, you know, that was our, our plan from the beginning. But now we're also storing all of this Ethereum style data. So when someone calls in and says like, hey, give me all of the receipts from this particular block, it's like, okay, fine. We go to that block, we look up this storage item, we get all of the Ethereum receipts. And you can see the, the data type right there. It's, you know, option of VEC of Ethereum receipts. So this is the same data type that comes actually from the Ethereum uh, crate from that EVM that we're using. Um, okay, yeah, so I guess just to say like a little bit more about wrapper blocks, this figure like the, um, I don't know, teal or like cyan blocks on the left, these are the normal substrate blocks. Substrate is authoring them just like it does in, in every substrate chain. And then off to the right, we're showing like in that on finalize call, which is the thing that happens at the end of executing every block, that's where we calculate the Ethereum block and we write it into storage there. So now if you want to know like, hey, at block 10, give me the Ethereum block. Great. We just look into substrate blockchain 10, which substrate nodes obviously can do and they do it all the time. And then we look from that storage at that, at that state at block 10, we dig out the Ethereum block and return it. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So now that we have all this Ethereum formatted data stored by Pallet Ethereum, we need a way for users to get that data and adding a custom RPC is the way we're gonna do it. So adding custom RPCs to Substrate is relatively easy in and of itself. There's a recipe that I wrote about doing exactly that in the Substrate recipes. And the Frontier project defines a crate that exposes all the standard Ethereum RPC interfaces, even the PubSub ones that Alberto showed off earlier, but for the sake of like, this workshop not taking all day, we're not gonna work with the PubSub ones in, in this part. So um, yeah, so there's all these RPCs that come with Frontier and the simplest ones of them just return some basic data like the chain ID or like slightly more complicated ones might query for some chain state. Um, and those are connected into the runtime via a runtime API. That's a standard technique. There's also a recipe about that. And like those ones are, are not, the, the hardest thing in the world. 
Um, but those are not the only kinds of queries. Like the, the ones where you're just querying about current state, it's really just a matter of plumbing, like, you know, data pipelines from the RPC into the runtime. And we can do it and we're going to do it in this in this demo. But there's these other more complex ones that people were asking about in Alberta's part of the talk that you want to like query historical data. So I want to I want to ask about what was the state at a particular block in the past. And not only that, I want to ask it in an Ethereum style way. So imagine that we like imagine I call up my node and I say, I want to know the state at this particular block hash and the block hash I give it is an Ethereum style block hash. Well, once I find that Ethereum style block, like no problem, we already talked about how we have all the encoded data and we can just give it back. But the problem is how do we get from an Ethereum block hash into the substrate block that corresponds into the like wrapper substrate block. And so for that, we're going to use another piece of the node that I think has hardly been mentioned at all today, which is called the aux storage. And so you can see in our storage table here, we've added another whole section and it's the aux storage. It's called auxiliary storage. And it's basically like a general purpose scribbling pad for the substrate node. It can write whatever kind of data it needs to there. And it's not, there's no consensus over it. It's not like every node is going to have the same information stored there, or at least that's not like inherently true. You know, you have to be careful to make that true if, if you want it to. And what we're going to use this aux storage for is it's just a place where we're going to write a mapping from Ethereum block hashes into substrate block hashes. And that mapping is going to be super useful because then when someone calls up on the RPC and says, hey, tell me some historical data about this particular Ethereum block hash, we just look into our block map and we say like, okay, well, that Ethereum block maps to this substrate block. And once we know what substrate block we're asking about, then we can look into the storage of Palette Ethereum and answer, answer all the questions just like we could for, for current storage. So that's fine. So we're, we're going to keep this block, map, uh, block mapping. That's a great idea. But the sort of last piece of the puzzle here is how and when are we going to maintain that block mapping? And so to do the maintaining, we're going to tap into the final part of the architecture that we're going to cover today, which is called the block import pipeline. And what there's an article about this on the Substrate Dev Hub, which is a really good primer. And I, I recommend it if you want to know more about it. But I'll also summarize it here. So the basic idea of the block import pipeline is that every time your substrate node wants to import a block, whether that's a block that your node authored itself or whether it's one that you heard about across the network, it passes the block through this pipeline and each piece of the pipeline gets to, first of all, verify, like, is this even a valid block? Am I even going to import it or are we just going to bail? And then second of all, like, if it is, we can do all kinds of other stuff like writing to the aux store, for example. So the block import pipeline is typically used by consensus algorithms like Aura or Babe or Grandpa. And you can see that I've still got the Aura and Grandpa pieces of the pipe in our diagram. What we're doing now is we're adding in Frontier. And the Frontier block import pipeline really isn't that carefully or that closely related to consensus. It's just installed in a part of the node that's typically used for consensus. And so here's the idea. Every time we go to import a block, and that means a substrate block, because this is a substrate node, the Frontier block import pipeline looks at it, and it digs out the corresponding Ethereum block hash, and then it, it updates that mapping in the aux store. And, and that's it. So now that we have that block mapping, we can answer queries for um, Ethereum block hashes. Uh, yeah, right. So we just talked a whole lot of interesting architecture uh, that's included in the Moonbeam node, and most of it came from Frontier. And you're going to see that in the when we start coding together here. Most of what I'm talking about comes from the Frontier project. So you might be wondering, like, what does the Moonbeam team actually work on? Well, one thing is that we uh, contribute a lot to Frontier itself. If you look through the PRs in there, a lot of them are from our team, especially Telmo. Um, and another thing is that we're building an Ethereum compatible parachain. So Frontier isn't the only interesting thing about Moonbeam. We're also integrating all of this Cumulus stuff. And so you can see in this slide, I've sort of swapped out for Cumulus consensus and Cumulus import pipeline. And that stuff is super interesting, but it's, it's not the topic that we're talking about today. There's actually another workshop going on for that right now with Ricardo, and it's a good one. And then the final thing is that we also have our own tokenomics. So, you know, whatever our staking model is going to be and all that stuff, that'll go into our runtime as well. Um, okay, so 
I'm ready to now get out the toolbox and start like hacking on this thing, but maybe I'll just oh. pause to see if there's questions. Um, yeah, so one that I was having was um, because of the concept that you're building on and how everything gets moved into kind of a vector in the palette, does the meme pool of Ethereum, the dark forest, um, kind of work in the same way or is that not really an issue so much anymore? Uh, Jesse, I'm sorry. Can you just ask that question again? I was about the mempool, right? Yeah. Does the mempool kind of work in the same way as it would on Ethereum or is that kind of foregone because you have to kind of first go through this whole substrate? Um, uh, yeah, no, it, it works. So we're using the substrate mempool. Um, it works in a way that is that it typically works for substrate. You know, it's queuing up transactions and like sorting them priority by priority and, and putting them into blocks and everything. And so the, the transaction, I actually didn't talk about this in the architecture part, but we'll see it in the code. When you submit one of these like raw Ethereum formatted Ethereum transactions, what happens is it comes over our PC and we do a little computation where we wrap that into an, a substrate style transaction. So it's like a substrate transaction and within it is the Ethereum transaction and the substrate transaction, even though it's really just a wrapper, that means that the, like, we call it the transaction pool, but yeah, it's, it's the mempool. It gets handled in, in the same way that it awesome. typically would. Awesome. Yeah. And, and there was one question that I can pull in from the side um, from Tom. Um, yeah. And it's, I haven't pre-read it, so I'll just read it straight. Um, I guess the unsigned intrinsics uh, uses EVM logic instead of substrate to validate that a block or transaction is consistent with the ETH blocks known so far. So what stops a fake block from being front run, which is consistent with all known blocks so far, because it was just built on n plus one, not n. Okay, yeah. So let me let me read it again. Try to wrap my head around it. I guess the uns, uh, unsigned extrinsic uses EVM logic instead of substrate to validate that a block or transaction is consistent with ETH blocks known so far. Okay, so I guess you're saying like if Alice tries to spend more tokens than she has, we need to like you know, before we include that, we need that we should just check and see like, is this transaction gonna gonna play correctly? And so what's the question part? Uh, so what stops a fake block from being front run? What's a fake block? I would assume a block that probably violates some sort of rules of consensus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because it was, uh, uh, yeah. How do you know TX transaction happened on Ethereum? Like just in general, uh, I don't know. Uh, Alberto, do you know how to tell? Like you get a receipt, I guess, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think that- um, uh, I, I was looking for the button, but, but yeah. I mean, basically <laughs> when you um, when you send a transaction through MetaMask, for example, MetaMask uh, sends it to like the regular Ethereum way, right? With the Ethereum adjacent RPC, and then it expects a receipt. And actually MetaMask, it waits for that receipt to confirm that the transaction has went through, but yeah. I mean, I guess it's basically the transaction has to go through the EVM to be processed and, and it's included on the, on the wrapped block, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, oh no, yeah, sorry, not being so clear, no problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty complex like topic and it's hard to fully communicate questions like we experience that in, inside the team all the time. So like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, remember Alberto was showing like just using regular um, tools, regular Ethereum tools. So like, however, MetaMask would typically determine like, is this transaction included? It just does the exact same thing. And we can answer those queries using the, the tools that I just described. Yeah. Oh, a certain amount of comfort. Well, yeah, there's that too. I mean, so the confirmations part is definitely different because like mm -hmm. Ethereum mainnet is a proof of work chain. So there you care about confirmations. Here you care about like uh, some notion of deterministic finality. So like in our standalone chain, we use grandpa. But in the Moonbeam parachain, which is really what we care about mostly, we're just going to be following like the relay chain consensus. I think Basti talked about that earlier today. So Ethereum frame uses a certain amount of... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. when you're configuring these pallets, there's a lot of like configuration options. And I'm going to show how some of those uh, work together when I'm, when I'm coding in a sec. Yeah, but at the end, it's what you mentioned, right? So in, in, in the regular Ethereum, basically, basically, you don't have instant finality, right? So you have to wait for a number of confirmations. But in Polkadot, you know, you have this uh, mechanism that, you know, assures uh, a finality when the block is basically it's finalized, right? So it, it's a little bit different. So it's it's kind of easy to get confused about these, you know, uh, common things that happen on Ethereum that are not applicable to to this Moonbeam, well, Polkadot ecosystem and meaning Moonbeam, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, cool. OK, so I think I unshared my screen, which was on purpose, because I want to share the whole screen now. And I'll start hacking. Um, OK, cool. So I guess that probably is sharing. And if not, Jesse can stop me. Um, so, all right, here's what we're going to do. Oh, yeah, I, I, I had one more slide to show, but I'll just I'll show it right now, which is fine. Um, so we're starting from the substrate node template. And uh, this is like an ad one that was listed as the advanced workshop. So we're kind of assuming that you know what the node template is and that you've done like one or two of these tutorials, like add a palette to your runtime is what we're definitely going to be doing right now a couple times. And specifically, you know, Substrate 2.0 was released recently. And I know that the Substrate Developer Hub team has made a, a great effort to support it as well as possible and encourage people to use that. And so that's what we're going to do today. And as we'll see, and as people have mentioned in other presentations today, it actually did versioning is like not totally smoothed out yet. But I can also give you sort of some tips about how I handled that for this presentation. So um, Alberto already shared the link to our uh, like workshop assets repo. And uh, so this is the, you know, the workshop Joshi folder. And basically this is like my notes on the rundown of, of how we're going to be hacking this thing together. And we're going to do it. So I don't think we're going to get to build the whole thing because we only have so much time, but we're at least going to hopefully build the whole runtime part. So we started out here with this node and then we added in pallet EVM. So that's the first thing I want to do. And we'll just start there. And if you're hacking along with me, either like live or just watching this back later, all the code snippets that you need are in here. And uh, we'll, we'll, I'm going to do more than just copy and paste and we'll like talk through what they each mean. Um, so, okay, here's my node template. It is, you can see it says like I'm detached. That's because I checked out this tag 2.0.0. You can see like that I'm on that commit. And so the first thing I'll do is just create a new branch here. Um, we'll call this like Frontier Workshop Live. And uh, whoops, we are like right on this commit that Dan made to release 2.0. So we're in the spot we want to be. And so we said the first thing we want to do is add pallet EVM. And so that's going to be in our runtime folder. And we'll start by adding the cargo dependency. So pallet EVM, it's like sort of part of Frontier, but the code actually lives in the main substrate repo. So this one is not going to be so tough to add. We just can take like any, pretty much any one of these pallet dependencies and copy it. Um, and I like to keep them in alphabetical order when possible. Okay, so pallet EVM, that's great. And then in substrate, we do this building to STD and building to no STD thing. So we just have to add the STD feature down here. Um, okay, and so the dependency is installed. And so now we can go into our runtime. And when you install a runtime, there's typically a couple things you need to do, like we'll probably need to use some stuff from it, uh, like palette EVM, and I forget exactly what stuff we're going to have to use, but the compiler will tell us in a second. And then every time you add a palette, you have to do one of these, you have to like implement that palettes trait. And this is where the configuration options come in or where some of them come in. So there's all these palettes in there already, even like, you know, this is the node template. So we have the template palette and it's harmless. So I'm just going to leave it in there. And we're going to do something like this, you know, impl palette EVM uh, trait for runtime. And then inside of there, we're going to fill in, you know, whatever associated types or other stuff it needs. And some of these things have this like, you know, parameter types in before it. And I think we need one of those. So I'll just, I'll copy it and I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second in case you don't know. Uh, and then the final thing is that we'll include it in construct runtime macro. So we'll just do like EVM comes from palette EVM. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what all it needs to go. But that's like the, uh, this is basically like the, the main pieces of adding a palette to your runtime. It's the same ones that are covered in that tutorial that I was talking about. So, um, I, since this is the first one we're doing, I want to go like a little bit through the process, not just copy the code because it sort of feels magic when I copy the code. And so when whenever you want to include like a new palette here, we, we have to look at its docs and see what types, what associated types and other configuration options does it have. And so one of the helpful links that I listed here was just the docs for palette EVM. 
And since Pallet EVM ships with Substrate itself, they have these docs hosted and it's like super nice and they're readily available. Um, so, okay, we're looking at its configuration trait. And here's the, all these associated types and we need to provide these. Um, so like fee calculator. And so this tells me, okay, well, I know that I need to start like this type fee calculator equals, you know, something, uh, whatever it's going to be. And so in general, you would say like, okay, well, let's see, it's bounded by this trait fee calculator. Let's see what that is. So, okay, it's a trait that outputs the current transaction gas price. And it looks like it just has this one method. So, you know, you could do something like making, you know, uh, pub struct my gas price calculator. And then you can like impl this, uh, wait, what was it called? Fee calculator for my whatever. And that works totally fine. And that's a really smart thing to do if you want to like do something specific with fees or like hard code a custom minimum fee or, or anything like that. But since we're really just looking on like, what we're trying to learn right now is how to configure this palette and like what are the most important parts. So we're gonna try to not do fancy things unless we have to. And it turns out that this fee calculator trait we need is already implemented for the unit struct, which is, which is great. And um, the implementation for the unit struct is this, the min gas price is always zero. So that's fine. That just allows us to, uh, you know, like have that min gas price. That's what we're, so that's what we're going to do. So we'll just put unit in there. Okay. So we're done with the fee calculator one. So let's go back and see again what the next one was. Uh, oh, I went to the wrong spot. So the next one is like, okay, call origin, right? And it has this trait bound ensure address origin. And I'll, I'll save you the like labor of clicking through all this stuff. This is exactly the same as the ensure origin trait that already ships with substrate. The only difference is it's going to give us Ethereum addresses as results as opposed to like account IDs, I guess. And, um, you know, if we want to see like what kind of implementations we have, we can do it just like before. There's a bunch of them like ensure address origin. That's basically like ensure signed. Uh, let's see. There's also like, uh, um, no, there's there's more than this. So let me see. Here's some ensure address never. That's like the origin. This will never succeed. Ensure address root. That's exactly the same as like ensure root that you always see. Um, and then there's these ensure address truncated. These are the ones that work, you know, with specific types of account IDs. And so all, all of all this stuff is, is just saying like, give, give me an origin. We just want to know, and there was, there was two of them. So let's see what they were. Um, there was two. Oh yeah. So there's the call origin and the withdraw origin. And that just means like what origin do we want to have to call transactions and which ones do we want to withdraw funds out of this like embedded EVM that's in the runtime. Cause the EVM in the runtime is like its own Island. It has its own set of accounts. And as we can see in the next type, we have to somehow map those back to substrate accounts. And this is actually like one of the things that Alberto is going to talk about as um, an interesting challenge. So I, I won't like spoil it too much. But uh, let's just see how this works. So what, for both of our origins, wow, that's tiny, huh? For both of our origins, we're just going to do ensure address truncated. This is basically just like ensure signed. And the truncated has to do with how we're mapping our addresses between Ethereum and Substrate. We're hashing and truncating them. Um, yep, and that's actually same with the address mapping. We're going to add map Ethereum addresses to substrate accounts by hashing and truncating them. And we're going to use the Blake two hasher. We need some like notion of currency to handle the ETH in our EVM. And we're just going to use the balances palette. Like always we could have pre compiles, but like, again, we're trying to be simple here. And so we aren't going to have any unit just means no pre compiles. And then finally we need this chain ID thing. And, uh, it's just at one of these times when you use parameter type. So I just made one called leet chain ID. And so our chain ID will be one, three, three, seven. Um, so we'll just take this code. Now I, I don't want to give you the sense that like you just look at one of these and you instantly know what everything is. You know, it takes some digging through the docs and like looking at other code to, to sort of figure it out. But hopefully this will start to demystify how we configure our EVM here. 
So I think that's good. And then the question is like, what all, I mean, I know some of these, like we need module, we need call, we need storage. I think we need events. Uh, I think it has a config. And um, yeah, so like, I won't do this every time, but what I typically do is when I'm hacking in something in the runtime, I just cargo check. And then I'm gonna give it this, this flag just means only use 10 cores so that it, cause if it uses all my cores, it's gonna freeze up the video chat and that's gonna be miserable. Um, so you don't normally have to do this, but since we're screencasting and then I just pass in like a node template runtime. And um, so there's a couple things to notice about that. Cause I know a lot of people when they're iterating on a substrate runtime, they run cargo build release every single time. And so there's a couple differences. First is that I'm running check, not build. So that's actually not gonna compile all the code. It just answers the question, would this code compile? And so it saves you time. And then the second thing is I'm not building the entire substrate node, just the runtime package. So that also saves me time. And so let's see why it didn't compile. So, oh yeah, right. Cause I use this like ensure address truncated, right? That's one of the things that I needed to import from Palette EVM. So let's put that up there. Um, yep. Boom, that's one of them. What other errors did we get? Uh, yep, I didn't import this either, so that can come. And then what else? Yep. Uh, oh, that's all it told me so far, so let's try again. Okay, we got another wave of errors. Oh, it didn't like that. Use palette EVM, ensure address truncated it. Oh, I didn't save it, rookie mistake. Oh, and if there are if there are any questions or even like discussion, compiling is like a good kind of puts in natural downtime to have discussions, except it only took 12 seconds that time. So, um, oh, and it worked, right? OK, so cool. So we're done with step one. So let's just call this like install EVM palette and we'll commit it. And now we'll move on to the next step. And the next step is, well, let me just show you. Um, I just checked the runtime, but if I check the entire node, it's going to fail. And that's because we need to update our chain spec. So now that we have this palette EVM in our construct runtime macro right here, we can see one of the things, one of the like, I don't really know what they call these, but like the parts of a module, one of the ones that this one uses is config. That means Genesis config. And so we can't start a chain with EVM palette unless we configure it at Genesis. And so that happens in our node source chain spec. And so I know I told you we were gonna start with the runtime and basically only do runtime. And that's true, we're still doing that, but I'm just fixing these little things in chain spec so it compiles. So first we have to bring in our EVM config and then we just add it down here like this, palette EVM. That's gonna be some EVM config. And it has, I think it has a single field called accounts and I think it's a B tree map. And I think we can give it an empty one, but I bet the compiler will tell me if I'm wrong. So let's just see. Oh yeah, so I have to use B, B tree map. So I think that comes from here. Okay, sweet. Um, that I'm gonna commit it since we did it, but I'll, I'll say a little more about that. Let's just say update chain spec for EVM palette. Um, so like I, I did a bunch of stuff, but you're maybe wondering like, dude, how in the world did you know what to do here? Um, and so specifically, like how did we know what goes in the EVM config? Well, that stuff comes, I think it's even in the docs. Let's, let's look at it there first. So in palette EVM, there's this thing called Genesis config. And it has some, it has one field in general, it might have multiple fields, but here it tells us like there's one field and it's called accounts and it's a map from H160 to this like Genesis account thing. And basically what that means is if you wanna pre-fund some accounts or give them non-zero initial nonces or anything like that, you can do that in the Genesis config. We're not going to do it because as I mentioned, we're staying simple and an empty config is as simple as it gets. But uh, I didn't want to leave you like hanging, not knowing how to do it. And so I did link this example and it's just a link into our Moonbeam repo where 
we Moonbeam team are working every day, but you can see it here. So you just make, let me make that bigger. You just make this thing called EVM account or you call it whatever you want, but like it's a B tree map. And then we just insert a record, you know? So here we put in some address that we care about and we gave, we were calling this account Gerald. And we, so we gave Gerald, uh, well, let's see, his not still starts at zero. That's the default. We gave him some balance. He doesn't, you know, no unique storage items and no, no code. Oh yeah. Right. So it doesn't even really have to be like an externally controlled account. We could also like, uh, put contracts here by giving it code and storage and stuff. So, okay. So that's that. Um, so now that we've done, uh, now that we've done Palette EVM and its Genesis config and we checked our work and committed it, now we're ready to go on to the Ethereum palette. So like just to stay oriented, we've added this one. That's our state machine. That's uh, sort of like in some sense, the most fundamental piece of the Ethereum compatibility story, but it doesn't do any of the cool like data formatting stuff. And so if you remember, that's what Palette Ethereum is for. So it's like, okay, great. We know how to add palettes. We just did it for Palette EVM. This should be simple. The one problem that we're gonna run into is that if we take a look at the Frontier repository, so that's Parity Tech uh, Frontier. It, oh, wow, that was already zoomed in. <laughs> and let's just look at its like nodes cargo.toml file. Or we'll just any cargo.toml file except that root one, I guess. But yeah, here we've got one now. And so we can see that like here's some dependency that comes from substrate. And instead of coming from like just version 0.8.0 from crates.io, it's actually taking these from GitHub. And so now we're starting to see the problem that other people have talked about today, which is that like, there's all these cool substrate libraries, but they're all based on slightly different commits of substrate and that makes them hard to use together. And that's totally true. And so while I was prepping this, I made this branch. Um, let's see, it's in our pure stake fork and it's the frontier project. And it's, uh, it's this one, I called it substrate V2. And it's the exact same code that's on the normal frontier repo, except I modified it to take its dependencies from crates.io. And so what that means is we can now use it on this node template, which also takes its substrate dependencies from crates.io. And I want to encourage people to do that whenever possible. I know it's not always possible. Like I was lucky that frontier happened to be close to compatible. And so I didn't have a lot of work to do. But I want you to like feel empowered to try when you have a library that uses dependencies from like the wrong substrate, try it out, see if you can switch them to what you want. And, you know, maybe maybe you'll be lucky and kind of get it to work and kind of level up as a substrate developer. Um, OK, so that tangent aside, let's just go ahead and install this thing. And we're running super low on time, so I'm going to get a little more copy pasty now. So this is what goes in our cargo toml. And you can see I'm using this um, substrate V2 branch that I just showed you. So I'm starting to think we'll probably just be able to insert the second palette and then, and then that's it. So let me just get on it. Uh, we're going to have to do this. And we also need to do this one. Okay, that looks good. And then in our lib.rs, now we can make our code changes and I'm just gonna copy them. So we implement its trait. And uh, so this trait is quite a bit simpler. It has the event type like everything or almost everything, that one's straightforward. And it also has find author and this is used so that we can extract the block author from the substrate block and insert it into the Ethereum formatted block. And um, the implementation, so we need to implement this find auth, the, the trait bound is called find author, and it requires us to return an option for an author account. And um, the implementation on unit just returns none every time. Oh yeah, I wrote that in the comment here. So we're just gonna, in order to keep it simple, we're gonna do unit so it won't include a block author just like on the parachain like Alberta showed earlier. But this can be done. It's actually shown in the Frontier repo also, so you can find that there. Okay, so we implemented its trait, and so now we have to do something like this. Um, whoops. Palette Ethereum, and you know, what does this one need? I think module, call, storage, um, event T. I think it's all the same ones, but the compiler will tell me if I'm wrong. So let's just see. 
And again, I'm only checking the runtime because adding a palette that has a Genesis config, I know I'll have to update my chain spec. Um, okay, so that didn't uh, work. So what did I miss? Let's just, it says only 293. Uh, let's just look at my copy paste snippets to see what I missed. Um, oh yeah, okay, so this, validate unsigned. And, oh, an event doesn't have generic parameters. Fine. Okay. So we'll put that in. And validate unsigned is actually important because you, you might remember I said um, Palette Ethereum is the one that allows us to execute Ethereum formatted transactions. And the way that we get those is as unsigned extrinsics. And so we need to validate them. In fact, this maybe starts to address what Tom was asking about earlier too. So let me show that code. Um, well, I have it locally, so I'll open it. So this is code in the Frontier repo, and it's in this Ethereum palette. And let me just find it. Here we go. Yeah, so we're teaching this thing how to validate an unsigned transaction. And so what it does is it, it takes in um, an Ethereum transaction. And so then, you know, we do all of this kind of stuff like, we say, we check the signature and the chain ID and, you know, we verify that it's fine. And otherwise we throw this error, invalid chain ID. And then we, you know, check the signature and otherwise we throw invalid signature. Um, and then like, okay, this might be a stale transaction. So I think maybe that Tom, that's what you're asking about. So it, when we take in one of these Ethereum formatted transactions, we do validate it using all of the normal Ethereum like transaction validating rules. And this is where that, that code happens. And then finally, if it makes it past all those tests, then we, uh, we let's see, then we call this builder to, uh, to build the valid transaction. So that was a little bit of an aside. Um, what I was trying to do was just make this compile. And I think it might now. Yeah, time feels like it stands still when you're like on air compiling. It's like the longest 13 seconds of my life. <laughs> so I'm gonna commit that one. So uh, let's just call it like add palette Ethereum. And uh, okay, so what I wanna do now, since we're like really running short on time is I wanna stop live coding this. You can follow through with our, um, like, you know, with this workshop repo. And I do wanna just like look through the last couple commits that I made. I made these all in prep so we can just look there. So the next thing we would do would be palette Ethereum's Genesis config. And it's like totally almost identical to how we did palette EVM. It's even simpler because there's actually no fields in its config. And this is also an interesting point that I wanted to touch on, but I'm gonna just do it briefly. So palette Ethereum, you might be wondering like, why would we even bother to specify a Genesis config? We didn't pass any data in there. And that's true, but Genesis config is not it's typically about passing in data, but that's not the only thing it's about. It's really about doing anything that your palette needs to do to initialize its state properly in the Genesis block. And palette Ethereum is supposed to store an Ethereum formatted block for every substrate block, and that includes the Genesis block. And so by including this like sort of trivial Genesis config here, we can tell the node that even on the Genesis block, even though there's no data we need to inject, to just go ahead and run some code in Palette Ethereum, and that code is going to calculate the Ethereum formatted Genesis block. So that's what that's about. So the next thing we were going to do was called wrapping Ethereum transactions. And it's just these couple little, so it's uh, some dependencies, I guess, but here's the meat of it. We implement this trait that comes from Frontier. It's called convert transaction. And we're implementing it for this silly struct that we put here. It's called transaction converter. And we're doing it twice. And we're doing it once to convert into an unchecked extrinsic. That basically just means like a substrate formatted extrinsic. And we're doing it again to convert into an opaque unchecked extrinsic, which is the exact same thing as unchecked extrinsic, except it's scale encoded. And so the node just considers it like basically like a vac of bytes. It doesn't really have any like strongly typed meaning associated with it. And the implementations are almost identical. Here you can see we do like the actual encoding stuff. That's not like hardly interesting at all. This is the interesting one. What we're returning for our unchecked extrinsic is, um, well, it's, you know, this 
uh, type and we're calling the new unsigned. So we're constructing a new unsigned extrinsic and unsigned extrinsics always call into some palette. We already saw this one. Um, we call palette Ethereum and we call the transact extrinsic. And then all we put in, this is the Ethereum formatted transaction. So this is the part that I was talking about where we take an Ethereum transaction and we wrap it up in a substrate formatted transaction so that it can be like put into the mempool or put into blocks and put in all the normal places where substrate transactions are supposed to go. So that's it in this commit. And then the final piece of the runtime is installing the runtime API. So there is also a recipe about runtime APIs. I recommend you read it if you want to do this. And um, I'll just show you the code real quick. So imports, not very interesting. Um, here we go. This is, uh, I, I need to show you more context actually, uh, even more than that. So in our runtime, down below construct runtime macro, there's a couple more types. And then there's this, and this isn't every runtime, it's called implement runtime APIs. And a runtime API is the way that any external piece of code that lives in the substrate node, uh, sorry, external to the runtime, but still part of the substrate node. So code like that can call into the runtime via a runtime API. And these are all pretty standard, like these just come with pretty much every substrate node, they're already in the node template. What we're gonna do is we're gonna implement a new one. So we're gonna impl, like I forget what it's called, but you know, it's like Frontier or something, and then it's uh, like ETH API uh, for runtime. Um, and there's a bunch of functions that we'll fill in. And so now that I've sort of given you the context of where this goes, let's just look at it. Uh, here we go. So yeah, Frontier RPC primitives, Ethereum Runtime RPC API, that's the one we're implementing. So it just does all this stuff, chain ID. Um, I don't know what that does. It looks like it just gives back basic info about the account, like maybe nonce and uh, I don't know, balance or something. So these are all just things that people might want to know. And by I guess what I mean is like users of the chain might send queries over an RPC that asks for data, like the chain ID or the balance of an account or the current gas price. And in order to answer those, we need to call into the runtime. And so now this code is exposing that API so that we can call and ask the runtime questions like that. Um, and yeah, I guess basically I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there because, um, well, we're just cause we're out of time and that was a lot already. I, I can say this was like really fun to prepare for. And so if people want to continue to work on that code, I would be happy to like support it and help people work on it afterwards. Um, so I guess, Alberto, do you want to talk about like some challenges? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Um, uh, you have control of the slide, so. Yeah, that's right. So we, let's oh, see. Uh, Where is this info? So here's the slide that we're getting to. So challenges. Boom. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, so I guess you have it. Oh, you don't have it maximized as it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, sure, all right. Sir. So basically the idea of this section is uh, because you know, Dan asked us a question to present to you guys, what are the challenges, right, of implementing uh, Ethereum compatibility? I mean, it's very nice that any project can just say, hey, I have an EVM, come, come, deploy, come deploy on us, right? So, but there is, there's a lot of challenges that we've faced uh, over the months and uh, we're just gonna go like through some of those. So uh, the, the first one, I think it's, it's, uh, it's I would say obvious from, from the standpoint of compatibility. And the thing is that you have substrate, uh, the state of the substrate chain on one side, right? And you have the state of the, the, the Ethereum side of things, right? So you'll have two accounts. You have the, the Ethereum account that is H160 and you have the substrate account that is H256, right? And actually, if you think about it, substrate has a bunch of features which are really cool, but they, they can actually also, create some problems when you have to yeah, when you want to have compatibility with, with an ethereum account right because in substrate you have for example governance and you have slashing and all these features that are non non-existent on ethereum right so the, the the question about all this is how can we actually create uh, less friction or like the ways to tackle this and and in our last presentation that alan gave out in, in july he mentioned about these three solutions right one of them is unified accounts 
Uh, so the idea is basically to support H160 natively, let's say, and the, the elliptic, elliptical curve algorithm for signing. Uh, and basically just say, all right, we're going to move everything to H160 and it's going to have the same features, right? So you'll be able to, to uh, so Glimmer, which is moving token, can, can be a governance token and you will have slashing and everything. Uh, well, in this case, it depends on, on the tokenomics, right? But anyways, the idea is that uh, unified accounts is basically everything is merging to H160. Then you have synchronized accounts, right? Which is basically an automatic ID mapping. So you have the account in substrate is mapped to an account in in uh, in, uh, in ethereum right i mean this could be one solution but you still have two different signature schemes and you still have two side of things right it's, they're not merged and, and the other solution could be just two different states all, all together so uh, there, there are two separate things and if you want to do some ethereum things you have to like move from, from one side to the other and then do the stuff that you want to do with your Ethereum token or Ethereum account. And then if you want to do some stuff in Substrate, you'll have to move them back. So it's a little bit more complicated. But I mean, this is this is one of the challenges that we have faced and, and uh, we're moving towards the, the unified account scheme. Uh, but I mean, there are different solutions to the same problem. And uh, the in the next slide, basically, uh, these are some other challenges that we have faced. So. Uh, Joshi, you move. Yeah. All right. So they're basically, I mean, these are other challenges that we have faced. Uh, actually, Joshi has, I would say, a lot of a lot of uh, background on this because on the first side, you know, the client development is harder, meaning that you have all these crates and documentations that is are really easy to understand substrate, but there is a lot of research to be done, right? So it's not. Uh, go ahead, Joshi. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, I think probably a lot of people who have followed us this far are at least a little familiar with Substrate and, you know, about like the tutorials they have and the docs about like writing your palettes and your runtimes and stuff are pretty good. And the outer node stuff, the non runtime stuff, which, you know, we didn't get to today, but like the frontier block import and anything that touches consensus and like that aux store stuff, that stuff is really not like as well trodden it's mostly just the people who are working on substrate who have used it and so it can be a little more challenging to get onboarded like you know as Tom wrote in the slide here like you know the the docs aren't aren't tutorials they're like comments in code and and stuff like that yeah, exactly. So I mean, I, I know that Telmo has had uh, some fun times so, you know <laughs> a lot of, a lot of days is researching stuff. Um, the other thing, and this is actually quite funny because, you know, Wei Tang, the, the one the guy who like, you know, built a lot of this frontier stuff, he has a huge background in Ethereum, right? Um, so basically when you're uh, building Ethereum compatibility features, you need to understand what is a seamless ETH to substrate compatibility layer? Like how does it look like, right? So uh, for example, if you don't have a strong background on Ethereum, then you have problems, right? Because you don't know, you're actually, you might be programming stuff, but you're not entirely sure how they should behave and stuff like that. So I, I guess like Joshi, you coming, you're, you're coming from the super, you know, you're very into substrate and rust, but you don't have a strong background on Ethereum and I'm the other way around, right? So. Yeah, it's a pretty nice, pretty nice pair up that way. But yeah, I, I will say like reading through some of the code, you know, you see these Ethereum types and for people who probably were Ethereum devs before substrate devs, that might be like super natural and they'll know exactly what that type is. But for me, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. Ethereum account, I have no idea what that struct is. And yeah, just gotta yeah. get used uh, to it's, it. it's another challenge that we face. And I think the last one that I, I showed you a little bit uh, today on the demo is that uh, we, we have built a lot of things on the standalone uh, node uh, because you know everything is tested on the standalone first and then it's port ported into Cumulus and Cumulus is under active development right now. So basically we have noticed like subtle differences right between uh, this, this implementation in, in, in the standalone and then porting everything uh, into, into uh, the Cumulus or the parachain really chain setup. So basically like the best, best block, what is the best block or the block author? As we saw that in the logs, there, were no, there was no block author uh, on, the, on the logs itself. But actually if we do that and we run it on a standalone node, you will see a block author because it depends on the, you know, the, the, the finalization method. So yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just like a three, like a couple of challenges that we face that, that we, we, no, we, we, we thought it was nice to, to present them because it's not easy just to say, hey, I want to implement uh, an EVM and everything's going to be rainbows and, and, and you know. <laughs> uh, 
All right, it takes, I, it takes time before the rainbows and unicorns yeah, show yeah, up. Definitely. I mean, we're still we're still uh, dealing with some issues, you know, and and that's why in our test set, our Moonbase Alpha test set, we have uh, released like a, a short term roadmap that we're trying to like add these features as as we help them uh, develop right on Frontier. So when we launched the test set initially, it did not have pop up because it was under active development. Once it was it's finished, now we on V two which was released on Tuesday, we, we add it, right? And then the next step, hopefully we can do it on V3, is add the unified accounts scheme. And that's, you know, the progress that we've made. Uh, it's basically uh, uh, just testing it on standalone and then porting it to Parachain. And, and then as more features come available in Cumulus, you know, we'll have to actually, you know, pour them into, into the Frontier. All right, so I guess, uh, yeah, thank you for, for joining into this very long workshop. Uh, I hope you, you make it to the end. <laughs> Uh, to get in touch with us, uh, you can go to our website, which is moomoo.network. We also have a very active Discord uh, channel. You can uh, We have different channels depending on if you're working on a standalone, on testnet. Uh, we're very active, also always answering there. We also have a, a doc site. So you, you saw that on, on my demo. We, we try to keep that updated and add new content as soon as, as it becomes available. Uh, it, actually, one of the, so some of the guides and tutorials that I went through today, they're, they're actually there. And feel free to you know to to visit our repos there as well at Moonbeam and Frontier. And actually, we're hiring, so you can go to our puresake.com website. And yeah, we have still a, a couple spots there. So I mean, this is today, right? October fifteenth. If you see this video in in four months, uh, I cannot assure you that. But <laughs> uh, yeah. So thank you, thank you for tuning in, and, and hopefully you you like this presentation today. So yeah. Jeff, thanks. Yeah. I don't know if you thanks have any for hanging with us so long, everybody. I know it's been a long day either. Like if you're in America, like me, an early morning or somewhere else, maybe a late evening. But this, oh, I, I, I had so much fun prepping this. I would love to keep working on it. So if anybody like, you know, was like, yo, man, I was having a lot of fun building with Frontier. I would like to keep that up. Definitely be in touch. You know, my info was on the slide earlier. And I'm also just like around GitHub and Element quite a bit. Yeah. Actually, on my side, I, we started on the afternoon, and I, I had to turn on the light because that's that's like tell me <laughs> we're in this side of the ocean. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Um, thanks a lot, Jesse, for hosting us. I appreciate it, and Ivana and everybody at Parity for the conference. Oh, thank you guys so much for presenting. That was fantastic. Oh, actually, uh, before I don't know if we want to ask, like, uh, is there an extra question? Oh. Uh, oh, okay. So yeah, we have a question from Scott. So Scott, do you still have that question? Uh, you can go ahead in the chat. Uh, basically, uh, oh no, you you deleted it, or I saw a question. Well, you, you can mark it as answered. They can be marked as answered. Like I think he was asking about the block explorer for. Oh, those are still there. No, he was asking about the chain ID and MetaMask. But anyway, Scott, like remember that there's a, a Discord channel. If you want to follow there, uh, we can help you out. Uh, feel free to go there and hit up, hit us up with any questions. We'll be there still for some time. So yeah, feel free to go there and, and we'll be there. So thanks thanks a lot for, for joining us again. So take it away, Jesse. All right, everybody. See you later. All right. Take it easy.